Got you. <laughs> So there's like so many people that are on our team now that yeah. came from all the people that have been involved in Sorry, I guess we need to get some folks. for the past like two years. Just with all these crazy projects on our team. We were one of those crazy projects that's out there to change the world. Mute that, Sachin? And make the scene. We're finding out. So. Yes. There we go. Yeah, Andy, see. what up, man? I haven't seen you in forever. Are you going to eat Denver? I'm in Marin Spurts, Austin. No. <laughs> wow. It's lovely to see you, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's get started. Thank you, Thank you Sachin. Um, should I just go ahead and get started? Yes. yes. And Austin's giving us the energy and Andy. <laughs> Ooh, okay, so let me just put the slides up. Uh, we'll get started. Share my screen. Okay. Right. Can everyone see my screen okay? We've got it. All right. Okay. So um, I guess let me just try presenting it so it's bigger. Okay, uh, so I guess thank you everyone for attending the first Gaming Guild session. Um, uh, I, I would like to start, of course, by thanking Austin, uh, our guest for today. Austin Griffith is, uh, I would say, has been very generous with both his energy and his time with the Colonel uh, Gaming Guild. And I think he's the perfect uh, person to be the one to introduce us to the Gaming Guild. And uh, uh, I guess we'll discuss that more over the next few slides. But just to start, the, the Gaming Guild initially started out as uh, game developers or people in the gaming space that uh, were part of Kernel. We, we wanted to explore the, what Web3 can do for gaming. And uh, it's kind of evolved over the past few Kernel blocks, but it has started out in the Genesis block. And, uh, and what, something new that we're doing for this uh, block is we want to focus more on learning by doing. and. Uh, uh, that's something that's been very deliberate with what we're doing with the, the session. So different from the other sessions is the Gaming Guild is actually one session a week. And then I'll talk a little bit about it in the next few slides. Uh, yeah, so today is the first session and I mentioned Austin is the perfect guest here because uh, we, we were hoping to make a Web3 game really quickly in the first, first session so that all of us understand what it takes to, to make one. Um, Austin has created Scaffold ETH, which is, uh, I would say, the best tool for someone to quickly get their feet wet in Web3. Um, and throughout the next few weeks, we'll try to build on what we learn from here. So first, we build a Web3 game. And then next week, we'll have Richard Davey, also, who's joined us today to create gameplay using Pacer, which is the, I would say, the, the, the foundational Web3 game engine or, or HTML5 uh, web engine. So if you do a, a, a Google for HTML5 game engines, Phaser will probably be the first one to come up. And uh, we, we will explore how to build on Phaser in addition to making uh, a Web3 game and kind of see the intersections there. And then we'll continue building on each of those uh, things that we learn until we, we close it out in the seventh session, which is thinking broadly about the games that we should be creating here in Web3 and uh, using all of the things that we learned from Kernel. And of course, um, Kernel wouldn't be Kernel without the, the inspiration that we get from the Learn Track. Uh, so uh, I suggest everyone also take a look at the Learn Track readings that we have. I'll share a link in the Slack uh, later today. But it's been co written by Andy uh, and has really captures the spirit of what we want to build in Kernel. I feel like uh, uh, something that not a lot of uh, accelerators focus on is. Uh, thinking of why we should build games and what kind of games we should be building. And the hope is that when you go through those uh, learn track readings uh, to, to possibly form Juntos with your peers around them, because uh, we might not have a lot of time to address them during each of the build tracks, which is really more focused on building. Um, but we will try to sprinkle a little bit of it during the sessions as well. Uh, Right, and this is more for Austin uh, and our guests, uh, just to talk a little bit about the Kernel Block Fellows. Uh, Austin has been with us for uh, a lot of blocks, I would say. Austin is like maybe your third or fourth uh, Kernel Probably, Learn Track, yeah. I would say, yeah. And, and he's seen uh, most of uh, 
the, the kernel fellows come, come through the traps, but of course, each block is a unique one. Today, we're joined by people from uh, big Web2 companies like Twitter, Facebook, Microsoft, um, industry professionals from Apple, Netflix, some crypto veterans as well, um, uh, alumni and current students of the top schools, I would say, and we deep genius in music, fashion, gaming, and I guess Vivek put this most importantly, food. I, I've yet to see the, the food genius yet, but hoping to talk to them soon. Um, and most importantly, I would say is uh, we have people who are three-dimensional humans here who aren't just builders, who, who I would say have the diverse uh, uh, diverse points of view that would allow us to build in Web3. And I think that's something that we've come to realize in Web3 and gaming in particular is that uh, uh, games are kind of uh, affecting everything that we're building. If you look at DeFi, for example, I remember Austin mentioned in one of the kernel uh, build drafts before, but that DeFi itself is a game, right? It's all about incentives. It's all about uh, how do we make people uh, uh, behave according to certain uh, social design. So the, the hope with the kernel gaming guild is we go past that. I think uh, I know that the narrative right now is uh, largely on play to earn in the games that we can build using play to earn. Um, Web3 though has the potential to be more than that. It's um, it's not just uh, copying the same games that we've seen and putting financialization on top of them, right? It's uh, Web3 and smart contracts allow us to, I would say, define the means of production. We can be the own apps, we can become the app stores. We don't need to make ads or in-app purchases to make these games. We need to explore it more deeply. Um, so some of the projects that have come through the kernel block, of course, is Andridge, uh, JS13K, Crypto Raiders, uh, Ronan's Conquest Youth, Eternal, some other games that, uh, that aren't uh, specifically games, for example, like, of course, Nifty.Inc from Adam and Austin. And the hope is we get a lot more of these experiments and really learn together because our kernel is, uh, as Vivek said earlier, is uh, a, a huge source of collective intelligence and it's it, it's really here that we can get to explore these things that we should be building. And yeah, and having said that, I think it's good for us to introduce Austin. Austin, as I said, is the perfect guest for us to start with. Uh, I've been learning a lot about uh, Web3 and Ethereum just from following Austin since the early days. Uh, he has really built purposefully, I would say, um, around getting more people into the space. Um, he's been building Build Guild. He's been, uh, he's created Burner Wallet, which I would say also shows that we should get more people uh, involved in economies, right? Without even giving them tokens and really playing with us, even if they, they didn't buy our token. So that's something I really appreciate around what Austin builds. And something that the, the, the Kernel Gaming Guild focuses on is how do we build infinite games? How do we build pro-social ecosystems? Uh, and some of the other projects, uh, I just listed a few, some of, and Austin has made quite a lot. So Gallias, which is the, the image up here, a blockchain game that he's still creating, right? Still building. And um, Nifty Inc, of course. And I, I have a link here of things people should read after this talk. Um, and, and yeah, and I guess, uh, Austin, if you want to do a bit of an intro before we get, get started. That's, that's great, man. You covered it. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to make sure that developers uh, have great tools and great educational content when they get into the space and they can quickly learn, uh, you know, what is Ethereum good for and what is it not good for and how do we get them up to speed building quickly? Yeah. The, and yeah, we're excited for, for that. So we're... I guess before we get started, I want I mentioned that I wanted to sprinkle a little bit of the kernel learn track here and, uh, and also to give you Austin a little bit of the kernel experience, I would say. So one of the this is the first uh, the first reading that's in the kernel learn track wherein Andy uh, added this article from from Grieber uh, and the mention and the topic is what's the point if we can't have fun? And I just wanted to read a few of the a few of the passages there. What is the why do animals play? Why, well, why shouldn't they? The real question is, why does the existence of action carried out for the sheer pleasure of acting, the exertion of powers for the sheer pleasure of exerting them strike us as mysterious? What does it tell us about ourselves that we instinct instinctively assume that it is? So, so the whole point of the reading is that uh, like people 
are so confused when some some something plays, right? But uh, the argument that Grieber gives us is that perhaps play is something that's uh, that's actually very foundational. That even maybe ants play or maybe atoms play. And I guess I wanted to uh, to pass the mic to you, Austin. So what do you think of of that? Uh, do you think that ants play, or is that uh, something that they just do as a self organizing system? That's that's a that's a great question, and it brings up like what the difference between play and work, and how we're kind of merging those things and work and play. I I don't know. It doesn't ant doesn't ant <laughs> yeah, play. I don't. I DK. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. Also, yeah. and Andy just really puts these here for us to to, to think more deeply about what we're do what we're doing. So yeah, so I just wanted to put it out there as sort of a, a base for what we start doing, what we're doing here, and. And yeah, so I guess I'll pass the mic to you again, Austin, so we can get started on Scaffold Youth. And uh, I can, should I stop sharing my screen? <laughs> yeah, so I guess- Sure, can, yeah, I can dive can in. Started. I can yeah. share mine. Yeah, yeah, if that's the plan. Cool, yeah. You tell me. Yes, okay. yes, yes okay. please, yeah. Uh, the hope is uh, you guide us through Scaffold Youth, uh, show, show the fellows how we can easily use it to build something. and. Uh, I know, for example, with sp speedrun Ethereum, you have an example there of how to build an NFT, uh, just just an NFT D app, uh, just really really quickly. So maybe that's a good place to start. Okay. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. yeah. So let's. Uh, first of all, like very 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 open ended here. Let's set a goal <laughs> yeah. and let's say let's deploy something simple to an L two that kind of feels like a game. But like, let's start from scratch. I have not thought about this at all. So like, it's probably <laughs> it, it not going to be, be fun, great. Right, yeah. We're right all exactly. Together. Yeah, yeah. So the, the first concept I want to dive into is Scaffold ETH. When you, when you get into Web3 and you start looking at all the tooling and you start looking at all the concepts, it's, you know, crazy overwhelming. I'll, I'll say like ethereum.org is a good place to start. Uh, a lot of stuff that you can learn there. Uh, it'll help you get started with you know, the why and the how, uh, there's, there's even, you know, tutorials and, and learn by coding and setting up your local environment, uh, there and, and you'll find scaffold ETH there. I think learn by coding, you'll find ETH build there. I uh, love to see REPL it kind of moving into the space too. really, really neat stuff. But let me, let me just zoom in on what makes scaffold ETH so important and so easy for you to build something. So I'm just going to follow the repo. I'm just going to pull it up, um, just like super manually stock. This is this is scaffold ETH. If you Google scaffold ETH, you're whoops. I think I just killed it. If you Google scaffold ETH, you're going to find. Oh no, I just created a another tab. If you Google scaffold ETH, you're going to find this repo. And what it is is kind of like an app or a decentralized app template. It's kind of all the stuff that you need to sort of iterate on your smart contract at first and then kind of have a front end that goes along with it. Let me try to zoom in here. So we did a yarn install and a yarn start and that brings up our front end. I'm going to do a yarn chain and that's going to run a uh, hard hat, which is like our, our local blockchain. It kind of emulates Ethereum and we can do transactions cheap and fast locally at first. And then the, the final thing I'm going to do here is a yarn deploy and that's going to package up this a temporary contract and deploy it to production. So this is the scaffold ETH stack. This is where you start. Oh, bring me, bring me that back. And you should have uh, localhost 3000. You should have an app here on localhost and you should have your smart contract. Let's just move it around and kind of make it a little bit bigger. So the first thing I want to show is this right here. This just, just kind of this process of I want to build a decentralized app. It's going to be backed by a smart contract. So I'm going to have to tinker with and learn Solidity. And the, the place you start is right here in Scaffoldy. This is, this is an example contract. You can see here, what do we have? We're, we have some string that we're storing, some purpose, and then some function to set that purpose. Uh, the contract can receive ETH, and there's an event getting triggered. One thing, if you're if you're into Solidity or or new to it, you haven't seen this. There's console logs in Solidity, which is really nice. So this is our smart contract. It is deployed. When I yarn deploy, it's just going to tell me that it's already deployed. And there's nothing to deploy. Uh, and here's your front end. And so your front end, if we go to debug contracts, should mimic what whatever you have in your smart contract. 
So let me just, uh, let's just create, uh, the first, first thing you do with Solidity is just learn the primitives and data types. So let's just create a, a, an address and we'll make it public and we'll call it owner. And remember, let's, let's, let's just call it me instead. When I say owner, it sounds like it's like this, this specific thing. It's not a specific thing. This can be named anything. And I'm just gonna say me, and I'm gonna paste that address right in there. And now I'm gonna deploy that. So, so I've just added uh, an address that we're tracking and hopefully it should show up over here. There we go. So now there's me, right? There's, there, there's the address. And so as you make changes over here, as you add a UNT 256 and make it public and call it counter and set it equal to five and deploy, that's gonna show up in your front end. So Scaffold ETH lets you kind of iterate on solidity and learning how it works by just making you making small changes here and you're seeing them show up over here, right? Let's add a function that lets us increment that, that counter, right? And it's gonna be counter plus plus. And I do this demo a million times. You've probably seen it before if you've seen anything with, with Scaffold ETH. What I'm showing here though, is that you're making small changes to your solidity and your front end is kind of auto adapting Okay, so we can't, uh, it doesn't let us increment right now because it's telling us we don't have any gas. So that's the next thing we can talk about is gas and wallets. So you'll notice that I have this uh, wallet up here in the top right, it's a burner wallet. When you first get into building, you probably don't wanna connect MetaMask right away. It's easier to just have a, a web wallet. And so let me create an incognito window just to show this off. If I go to localhost 3000, and we look here, there's kind of like green guy, right? We kind of have like purple blue guy over here and we kind of have green guy over here, right? And a nice big call to action to grab funds from the faucet, the faucet being our, our local blockchain here, but we can even kind of pull this up and say, let's send uh, $10,000 to green guy, right? And now green guy has $10,000. And, and you have a lot of things that come out of uh, off the shelf here, like this nice wallet component where it has a blocky preview. This is e even, uh, uh, ENS, right? If I do Vitalik.eth, I'm going to get Vitalik's address. Let's send Vitalik $10 on our test net. We just did, right? Uh, let, actually, what I wanted to do is send this guy a little money. So if I paste this in, you can see that this little purple blue guy kind of matches this purple blue guy. I can kind of visually inspect that those wallets are right. And I can send maybe $1,000 over here and we should see that show up over there. So that's wallets in Scaffold ETH. You're going to have these nice ephemeral wallets. Uh, once you have gas, you can just kind of click these buttons and it's going to fire transactions. See how my counter is incrementing? I'm not doing anything like saying yes to MetaMask and changing the network and worried about the chain ID, right? Let's, let's throw MetaMask out at first and let's just kind of poke at our contracts and get a feel for how these things work. Okay, so uh, nice. uh, let me... Yep, Maybe just, yep, go just ahead. to add, Austin, so the... So the network or the blockchain that is uh, that this is working on is hard hat, right? Which is uh, which is a test, this one right uh, here. A test yep. blockchain, yeah. Yep. And exactly. the wallets are burner wallets, so that's why you yep. don't need MetaMask. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that gives you the ability to kind of just hack away at this solidity and figure out how this solidity works. If you're thinking, I'm going to need a raise of structs and I'm going to need a random number, this, this allows you to kind of like tinker around with those things at first and not have to build a giant test suite, not have to worry about things. You, you kind of have a nice front end that lets you interact with your contract right away. Oop, let me open up the chat too. Basically, like 100% uh, open to chat. It's going to take this slow, going to go through this. Looks like someone has a hand up. I guess you can ask here or you can post it in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. Hi, Austin. Would you mind just uh, saying what are the tools you're using? What are all the softwares we are seeing on the screen that you're using right now? Yep. Okay. So this is basically scaffold. This, this is just scaffold ETH, but within scaffold ETH, you have hard hat and create React app. So you've got create React app, you've got hard hat, and then scaffold ETH also brings in uh, what's known as ETH hooks and ETH components. So there's a bunch of handy components and hooks that I found myself using over and over again at every hackathon that we decided to just build into scaffold ETH. 
And now those things have even been ejected out. If you go to ETH hooks or ETH components, you'll find that they are their own NPM library. And the guy who's working on this, Shravan, would tell me that I need to make sure to shill scaffold ETH TypeScript. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't tried that out yet, I'm going to paste it into chat. If you're a big TypeScript person and you're looking to build the scaffold ETH, there's also uh, a flavor of scaffold ETH for TypeScript. So the tools are basically, I've got Atom, right? Whatever your code editor, any code editor, VS Code, Sublime. So I've got my code editor here. I'm using iTerm2 for my terminals. Uh, but yeah, the basic, the basic tools, the, the main tools here are hard hat for my blockchain and then create React app and scaffold ETH is basically a, um, a workspace. It brings all of those work, all those together. It, it, you, you have hard hat and React app all, all in one kind of, you get clone that thing down and it has hard hat React, even, even stuff like the graph that you'll get to later on, uh, when you start like it has a lot of these production level tools that once you get your app or your game to production, you're, you're gonna be glad that you had those things along. Uh, one of them is like a network selector. If I go ahead and connect my MetaMask, look at that, can you believe it doesn't even pop up? Do you guys see that? There's no MetaMask pop up when I click that button, it's hidden. Can you believe that? Can you believe that garbage UX? <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's log in. I, what I wanted to show is if I'm on the wrong network, Scaffold ETH is going to give you a little warning, but we're waiting for MetaMask. Can you believe it takes 10 seconds for MetaMask to load up? What's happening right now? <laughs> okay, so MetaMask finally loaded. Here we go. Uh, so if I'm on mainnet, but this thing wants me to be uh, on localhost, something messed up with that connection. Let's try it again. There we go. You're going to get a nice network error saying, hey, careful, you're on mainnet, you need to be on localhost, and then a nice little button that lets you switch over to whatever that network is. And I'm gonna cancel that and log out. I just wanted to show you lots of handy things that you're going to need when you get to the point that you have like a production level app. A lot of it's built in here. Some folks land and they're like, this is way too much. Like, don't focus on that. I know there's a lot of stuff around here, but they're necessary things for you that you'll need eventually. Where you should be focused is right here on this smart contract and doing a yarn deploy and poking at your contract in the in the front end. Let me see what let me see if there's any major questions here. Uh, one, oh, one uh, thing to to add yeah. also, Austin, I really like how Kevin says like scaffold ETH is like the Ruby on Rails of Web3. I think that's a good way to think about it. Where in it anything you need to get started really is it, just there on scaffold ETH. So Austin has already done the uh, curation of the uh, I guess the stack that we will need to to build really quickly. So so that's why it's able to do this really fast. Yep, exactly. Yep, and uh, it's. There's not, not just the starter kit that I'm showing here, but a lot of people have taken this starter kit and made new starter kits. So I, I noticed a question there about L1 and L2, uh, like an optimism starter kit, right? Or, and really, you don't really need an optimism starter kit anymore because it's, it's like EVM equivalent. You just, the, everything that we're doing here, we're just going to point at optimism and deploy it, and it's all going to work almost exactly the same. So, uh, yeah, and I think when curious if anybody has any opinions, like, this summer is going to be insane because of L222, right? Basically, we're going to have an EVM equivalent network where all of our fun blockchain games have been too slow and too expensive. We can deploy them to Optimism, Arbitrum, some of these other L2s, and you're going to get fast, quick transactions. You're going to have NFT crafting. You're going to have all these big generative worlds. There's going to be so many cool things in the game realm. And this year is the year that those things are going to blow up. We, we've had this discussion many times about what makes a good blockchain game, and we can kind of get into that a little bit too. Uh, but I think there might be a question up. Uh, let, let's go ahead and shoot. Sh go ahead if you have your hand up. Uh, L222. Here, let me put this, put this in here. Question was, go ahead. we deal with L2 in mind directly, or should we still start by supporting L1? So is the question do you start by supporting l1 if you're going to deploy to l2 is that what the question was uh the question is do we build for l2 directly or oh yes yep. One, one l1 yep yep it, it, be, because block times are uh hard to predict on l1 because things are very expensive what you'll see is builders 
on side chains or on L2s kind of start using Ethereum like a database again. <laughs> and, and that's not great, right? But to, to answer that question, you almost have to build specifically for the L2. Even specific L2s are going to be different. They're going to have different block times. They're going to have different uh, network delays and costs. So you almost want to target the network you're going to build on, depending on, you know, is, is this specific action going to be on chain? Or are we going to use signed messages? Is this going to use some kind of Randau, like random numbers? Is it using block hashes? If we're using block hashes for randomness, does it work? It, you know, is it secure on this network or can miners manipulate it? So I would say that you are, you are definitely building your game for a specific L2, even though like the EVM stuff, like I've been building games for, I basically been building games for side chains for the last three years. There are EVM equivalent, there, there, there are NFTs, there are ERC 20s, all of these things part of this game economy, but they're way too expensive and slow for mainnet. And there isn't really a good secure option yet on, on now, but now there is. There never really was, but now there is. And, and we have optimism and others, and we'll show those off today. Hopefully that answers the question. What are some good use cases where you still go for R1, for example? Well, I mean, like anything that needs like hardcore liquidity, like like it it it, it depends on what kind of that's that's a good question. Like once you have L2, why would you build on L1? I think that's where all the liquidity and all the users are, right? Like say you need, say you're building a DeFi game and you need a whole bunch of liquidity that only exists on L1, right? Or, or say you wanna sell an NFT, like not very many people are buying NFTs on L2 yet. So mm -hmm. if you wanna have a successful NFT launch, you usually do it on mainnet where the rest of the buyers are basically. Coach. Does that Thank answer you. it? Cool, yep. yep, yep. Okay, and L222 is layer two in 2022. This is the year, this is the year of L2s to, to explode. Uh, I think Wait, I think we got most of that. What's your recommended L2 yeah. though? What, what uh, right now it's optimism. The easiest to start off. Like yeah, that. yep. I, but but like I should not like I'm not I'm not here to king make. They're all great. Go play like zk sync, Polygon, uh, Optimism, Arbitrum. Any others? Shout them out if there are others. Gnosis Chain. Does that even count? It's kind of like a side chain where I've been building games. Uh, there, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, but I think that my most I have the most fun on optimism right now. And if, and if I were to, uh, you know, send Paul $10 right now on an L2, I would do it on optimism because it would cost me about a dollar rather than I think Arbitrum costs a little bit more. So in terms of comparing optimism and, and Arbitrum, if I was sending $10, I think I would do it on optimism. And I've tested that like once. So it's like, all this stuff is very, very new. So take this for what it's worth. Get in and play around with all of them and see which one you know works out best for you. I guess to I your point to... earlier, Austin, like uh, like anything, all of these doesn't have to be built on a specific L2 right now, right? You can just do it on a testnet. As long as yep. you're building on Solidity, then yeah, then you yep. can put it you on any chain you want. Yeah. Build it all locally right here, right? And have the game basically running. Okay, so the thing that I always show off Every, every one of these uh, gaming guilds, I talked through uh, this tweet from 2018 from Alex Van de Zandt about what makes a good blockchain game, right? So it needs to be a good game first, right? You need to be able to enjoy it. It needs to be fun. Uh, explore what makes blockchains unique. Uh, you, you need to design around those limitations. The persistent always on world. Players own the game and the items and the experiences allow anyone to design and improve. And the last one is a little scary one, but embrace bots. Understand that if you're building a game with an economy, there's always gonna be bots and you need to probably make it pretty programmable. If we could zoom in on someone who's doing that very well is Dark Forest. Dark Forest has made their game very programmable. And you see like, you basically can't even compete unless you're running a suite of different tools, you know, and you're coordinating as a DAO to, to, to make moves. So, and, and like all of that kind of emerged, right? So really neat stuff there. Let me, let me then skip to something that he tweeted today, I think yesterday. So same guy, uh, but tweeted this yesterday. The only reason for someone to make a blockchain game uh, is if they don't want to control it. And this is something we've really started seeing, even like Loot, right? Loot was a really good statement about composability and about how 
actually blockchain games are probably going to be a large group of a lot of projects. You may, you may have a land generation contract and all that does is generate land randomly. And we all trust that thing to kind of say like, you know, here's where the trees are, here's where the water is, here's where the resources are. But all, all that developer was thinking about is making a good composable layer. And then some other developer can build on top of that. So a lot of what we are gonna see with these uh, kind of blockchain games is that the best ones are gonna be ones that no one owns, that are owned by the community, that are just simple pieces. And it's gonna be kind of putting all those simple pieces together. I, I think last time we did this, I said, one really good thing you could build is basically a, uh, I, I think I called it a loot bag and it was before loot came out, but it was building your inventory. In, in web three, your inventory and your identity follows you from app to app. So if someone wants to see games be successful, they should build a really good inventory app where you can throw in a sword and a shield and you can send that whole you know loot bag over to someone else. But what that is, is it's creating this really nice composable layer of inventory that then many other games can build off of. And that's just like a good concept that we should have like in our heads as we're building these things. You're not like, if I could go back in time to, to Galias Austin and tell Galias Austin, you're not building the whole game. Quit trying to build this whole game, build small components and get people to use them, right? This, this game is, is, way too complicated. It's like this hand-painted world. There's, there's a market where you can buy and sell things. There's fish that you catch with, with commit reveal. There, there's a whole storyline that kind of comes with it. There's ownership of castles. And by the way, this castle is a smart contract. So I can click on this contract and I can go look at the, the source code behind what makes this castle work. Oh, looks like I can't look at the source code. <laughs> so if past Austin should have verified that contract. You can purchase this land for 1500 copper though. But this, this is an example of, I tried to build the whole world instead of trying to build the one component that sticks. And, and maybe something like this would be successful right now. And it, it kind of scales out. You see ships kind of showing up here. It is like this really cool, like massive multiplayer game, but I tried to control the whole thing. And I don't think that's the right angle. I think it's more about let's build these components and let's see things kind of composably stack on each other. Yeah, so yeah, just, just zooming just in on that. Just want to second yeah, that ahead, also. And, and something, I, I think, Something that we can think about, Austin. Just I'm just reminded of that tweet by Alex around uh, you not wanting to control your game. Um, in some, I guess for example, the, the platform like Nathan Schneider, I, he champions this uh, uh, this term called exit to community. So that might be something that people can think about. So, but if you have a game and then you exit it to, to your community, what would it mean if they were the ones controlling the game? And and I think it's right. Like blockchain. Uh, it really makes most sense if you don't want to be in control of something. We've seen loot uh, to your to your point was one of the greatest examples of that. So so yep. yeah, we need to start thinking of games outside of the current boxes that that we we are looking at uh, them from. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And and when we deploy this smart contract over here, a concept that we should be thinking about is if we deploy this correctly not even we should be able to stop it. It should be completely unstoppable, right? You should build this contract, you should deploy it, and then you don't have any control of it. No one has any control of it. It's gonna do exactly what it's programmed to do forever. Now there, there is some stuff like you need upgrades and you need governance, and there you go. If you, if you wanna have an upgrade system, you could have an upgradable contract and only the community with a token vote could upgrade that contract. Going back to Galias, I could say, oh, not Gateway. Going back to Galias, I could say, okay, if we're gonna upgrade the contract and add five new buildings, we need a token vote. And everyone who owns any copper in Galias is able to vote on that in Snapshot, right? Going, going to Snapshot there, something that didn't exist when I created it, Galias, there's all these composable components in terms of governance and, and a lot of other things where they exist now. And I could take anybody who owns some, some copper and have them vote in a, in a new tool, not having to build all of those tools myself, not having to build the market myself, right? We have Uniswap V2 now, and I can deploy that for this smart contract. And this market could be more of an AMM instead of me trading you know, timber for five copper, right? Okay, uh, th this last thing here is really important. The problem, of course, about building a good game that you don't control is you're not gonna get rich doing it. 
the, a lot of people come in and say, I want to build on blockchain because I want to get rich. Maybe you should just go launch a PFP NFT right now, right? Like if you're if you're really here for the shortest path to getting rich, go go do something else. Like games probably aren't going to be the thing that get you rich because if you deploy a good blockchain game, you're not going to be really in control of it. It's going to be a community run thing and the community will control it. So we're here for the love of the game and for the love of the build. build. Okay, last thing, uh, a commit reveal game. That's what I wanted to do. I'm going to post this tweet that I just made. Uh, oh, <laughs> I just linked to my timeline. I'm sorry, I'm a knucklehead. Here we go. Let's get this tweet here. We just had a bow tie Friday. And uh, my homie Daniel did this commit reveal uh, paper, rock, scissors game. So when you're building on blockchain and you're thinking about what kind of games can I build, you got to remember that it's a public deterministic blockchain. So everyone can see all your moves. So this was a way for two people to play paper, rock, scissors, but not be able to know what the other person's move is. And it takes like multiple moves. It takes multiple transactions. It's kind of a pain in the butt. But I wanted to post that as like a here, here's a good example of where blockchain games really shine and, and what you have to watch out for when you're building on chain. And, and randomness is another one of those. And I think we'll get into randomness a little bit here. I think we should our game should probably have a little randomness in it if we're going to build a game. But any, any other questions as uh, we kind of move? I'm going to leave that there because I'm going to need that for randomness. But let's let's start tinkering with our contract. Uh, let me let me open it up again. If anybody has any other questions before we decide, or let's let's figure out what kind of a game we can make here. Okay, so uh, we've tinkered with a counter. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. We have this owner named me. We'll probably keep that around. I don't know if we'll need to do anything with that, but let's keep that there. Um, Let's show console log. Really, really good thing here. Let, let's go ahead and deploy this. Oh, whoops, yarn chain. I don't want a yarn chain. I want a yarn deploy. Let's go ahead and deploy our contract again. Kind of bring the focus back to scaffold ETH, back to prototyping, back to thinking about solidity and how we're going to build a game. I also, I have not planned for this at all. So I have no idea what kind of thing we're going to build here. I don't know how we're going to do it in a, in a small amount of time, but we'll, we'll tinker around. Uh, so there we go. I just redeployed that contract. And what I want to show here is now that we have funds from the faucet, right? We've kind of went down here and grabbed some funds or whatever. Uh, we can now say hello world or something. It, it notices that there's this set purpose function that takes in a string. So it gives us this nice interface. And I'm going to say hello world. And there we go. And what I wanted to show here is that this console log happens over here. So as you're debugging your smart contract, you're trying to figure out what values are what, what the heck is going on here? Why is this doing what I think it, it does? Uh, you've got this nice console log here. And notice I'm just kind of like comma separating the this address, the message dot sender who's calling it, and then some string to let me know what it is, and then the purpose. And we see that over here. We say this address set the purpose to hello world. And every time I, I say, I make a transaction there, that, that console log is there. So that'll help you kind of debug uh, as you work through things. I saw in your game, you need to buy NFTs to play. Is there, uh... yeah, I mean, like you could, you could token gate, you could token enable the NFT. I think that like, when, when <laughs> that's another thing. When you're building these games, like, yes, you need to have like great blockchain knowledge, but really, you probably need to understand economics more than anything, right? Like, like macro microeconomics, how are those things going to work? Uh, in this case, it's if, if I have a token and this game is token gated and there's a sync for that token, then is there going to, you know, is this going to cause inflation or is this going to cause like supply and demand stuff? Uh, I, I am not an economist. I, I have basic, I, I remember economy, uh, like economics 101 from, from college, but I slept through most of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I am not a great economist, but blockchain games are going to need great economists and token economics folks. Go ahead, yeah. Paul. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, it's so I, I mentioned games in blockchain really run the gamut, right, of everything that's happening in Web3. So I, I would suggest people also uh, look at the tokenomics discussion. 
Um, yeah, because because it's really complicated. But uh, just to add to this question, I think not everyone has uh, already found the the right model for games to work in Web three. I, I mentioned play to earn earlier, right? Like play to earn. Uh, I would say still is in the first versions. Like we haven't found the, the exact model that most people will want to play forever, right? And that's why we're exploring these spaces. And maybe for example, loot, like Austin mentioned loot there, when, when you get, uh, there was a version of loot where you can, anyone can just get an NFT, right? That it wasn't gated uh, uh, according to how much people pay. So maybe it's worth exploring these models as well. Yep, 100%. Uh, okay, so zooming in, I wanted to show just one line of solidity that's super important. You as the game builder, you're going to have to build a lot of rules into your game. And those rules are going to be in these require statements right here. So this, this is a function that anyone can call right now. Uh, it's public. But what we have is this nice rule, this first rule that says the message.sender, which is the person who's calling this function, has to be equal to the owner or we're going to revert. And I'm going to save that. I'm going to push that out. And I'm going to test that line of code and show you how writing rules are going to be super powerful for your game. So I've changed it now where only the owner can write it. And if I say, hello world, certainly this should work. OK, but oh, actually, did I reload? I may need it to reload. No, we're good. OK, but if I come in from, oh, no, wait a minute. It did, oh, I think we're good. Let's let's just find out, let's test it. Remember that incognito window, I'm gonna bring in kind of a bad guy. So I've kind of got my, my good guy, my owner over here, and then I've got blue, this blue purple guy is kind of our bad guy. And he's gonna go talk to the same contracts. Remember, smart contracts are like massive multiplayer RPGs. Anyone can get to them at any time and access them, right? There's, there's no censorship resistance, this thing is, this thing is deployed and not even we can stop it if we wanted to. So uh, let's set the purpose to something something bad, right? Let's say this is the attacker and he's trying to set the purpose. He's got some gas and he clicks it. Oh, he gets an error, not the owner, right? And, and let's like make sure, yep, okay. So now we've kind of tested that line. We wrote a rule that says only the owner, who is this dude, can get in here and do this stuff. And, and we've tested it. We've tried it from a bad guy and we've tried it from a good guy and it seems to work. Now, of course, before you go to production, write a big test suite that tests all the edge cases. But for us as a game builder, tinkering around with our solidity, this is, this is helping us get our footing and we're kind of understanding now, now this function, which used to be a public vending machine button that anybody can hit, now only the owner can hit, okay? All right, so the next uh, thing I wanna show off, that's that's requires, it, you, if, if you're just getting into Ethereum, go speed run Ethereum, speedrunethereum.com. One thing I'm shilling here pretty, pretty hard, uh, but it's going to talk through the things you need to learn. Uh, global units, units and primitives. We kind of talked about how uh, this address was a primitive and the uint 256 was a primitive. You also have bools and addresses or bools and ints. Uh, but learn, learn those primitives. And then the next thing to learn is, is mappings. And that's basically how a token works. And I think if we're going to have a game, we probably are not going to do a heady, I'm going to build a struct and have an array of structs. I think if we're going to build a game, it's probably just going to be something that revolves around a mapping. And, and what a mapping is, is basically uh, given some address, you, that links to some UNT256. So what that works very well for is balances, right? Uh, maybe I can just do balance of there and I can hit save. And let's go ahead and set the balance of our owner, right, to 100, okay? And let's deploy it, right? Small changes, let's tinker with this, let's poke at it and see if it does what we think it will. So hopefully uh, we will get a mapping now and we should be able to check the balance up. So if we were to check the balance of our owner, sure enough, we've got a hundred, okay? Now, an ERC20 token uh, has basically a transfer function. Let's set up a transfer function where it goes some address to some UNIT256 amount, and we'll make it public. And what happens in a transfer function? Well, basically like the balance of the message dot sender, the person who's getting into here is gonna go down by some amount, right? And the balance of the two person is gonna go up by the amount. Look at that. And we've built ourselves a token and let's deploy it. 
Uh, of course, the ERC-20 token standard has allowances and approvals and transfer froms and some other nice things. But at its heart, this is basically it. You, you have a contract where we start out uh, as this guy and we get our balance and we have 100. Now let's bring in our bad guy again. And let's go to local host. And remember, there are no bad guys. Everyone in Web3 is adversarial. They're all bad guys. They're all jerks. But the blockchain allows us to coordinate. And we don't have to trust the humans. We only have to trust the code. And the code is just a vending machine in the sky that we can access. And it's going to do exactly what it's programmed to do. Were you jumping in there, Paul? No. I was okay. Just, <laughs> okay. I'm used to okay. what you said. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So this guy's balance is zero. This guy's balance is 100. Now let's go use that transfer function. So I'm going to grab this guy's address. Let me make sure I did that right. Yep. Okay. I'm going to grab this guy's address. See that nice little blocky preview. I can tell that it's pink guy. It's pinky. And I'm going to send pinky 10. Send. Okay. Now if we go over here and we check pinky's address. 10. All right. We've built a currency into our game and we've allowed our players to send that currency around by only adding a mapping for a balance and a transfer function. Now I'm gonna throw one wrench in here. I'm gonna set this equal to ether. Instead of 100, it's gonna be 100 ether. And that is gonna make one small difference. And what that is, is basically saying, ah, so TLDR, there's no decimals. I can't, I can't do something like 1.25, 1.34 in solidity. What you have to do is do something like 134 divided by 10 or, or 134. I'm just throwing out examples divided by 1,000. Or if you wanted it to go up by 1%, you'd do something like that, right? Or if you wanted to go up by 0.1%, you'd do something like that, where you have a numerator and a denominator. So what I'm just showing off is there's some gotchas as you start building this. And this first gotcha is ether versus way. You could even probably do ether versus way and see a good example of what the heck. So way, when I say, when I said a hundred there, that's a hundred way. By adding this ether onto it, what it's actually doing it is taking it times 10 to the power of 18. So it's actually taking our hundred and adding 18 zeros to it. And what that does is just give us some room to work in terms of using some fake decimals. We kind of like sw swap the decimal point 18 points and that lets us kind of fake decimals, fake floating point math uh, inside of Solidity. I just wanted to show that real quick because as I'm sending these around, you'll notice that when you grab an ERC-20 and you start sending it around, you're actually, when you send one, you're actually sending one times 10 to the 18. And if you only send one, you're only sending one way worth of it. And that's that's not any at all. And we're gonna see that real quick here. I'm taking this real easy. When Paul gives me two hours, man, I take my time. Oh, ETH bill, there's a cool one. <laughs> that wasn't what I was going for though. There we go. Okay, so uh, now my balance is, is 100, and it's gonna be really hard for you guys at home to see that, but it has the little ETH symbol next to it. And you gotta be careful with that because now it's not 100, it's 100 ETH, right? And if I send if I send this dude 10, like I did last time, it's gonna send him 10 way. And if we go check my balance, it's still gonna be 100 ETH because I sent, look at that, see 9999999999. There's a one way down the decimal chain there that, that, that got sent, right? If I wanna send him 10 ETH, I need to go do that same thing again, but I'm gonna say, oops, let's grab his address. Notice that nice blocky preview right away, let me know that I had the wrong account. And now instead of sending 10 way, I'm gonna send 10 ETH by hitting this little button right here and taking it times 10 to the 18. Obviously in your app, you're not gonna have the user to multiply it by 10 to the 18, but for the developer, this tool is supposed to kind of nudge you to understand like, oh, once this goes to the chain, I need to take this, you know, when, when I'm talking to the smart contract, I need to take it times 10 to the 18. When I'm talking to a human, I need to divide by that 10 to the 18 so I can show them a nice decimal. For instance, what if I wanted to send, okay, let's check this dude's balance now. Nope, that's the contract. Nope, that's the wrong thing. Let's check this dude's balance. It's 10, right? Let's say I want it to be 10.1. If we were talking way, you'd never be able to give him 10.1, right? So if I want to send this dude 0.1 ETH, I can go 0 0.1 and I can use that decimal, but now I can multiply it out and it's a nice whole number and hit send. And if we go check that guy's address now, uh... <laughs> Where did I send that? Uh, 0 
uh, balance of this dude. <laughs> that should say 10.1. I don't know. Uh, Maybe hard hat is bugging out. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. no, it's, it's certainly my own stuff, I'm sure. So mm -hmm. if I send him one times 10 to the 18, is this going to go to 11? I feel like maybe we have some rounding going. Oh, no, no. Something extra weird is going on. I don't, I don't know. Am I sending to the right character? Is my balance, I don't know. Let's just skip this. We don't want, yeah, see, we're seeing this go down, but I'm not seeing this guy's balance go up. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Oh, there it is. Okay, so oh, something with needed to clear it or reload. <laughs> I, I don't know. This, this is why it's so important to have good tools. And I'm saying good tools are the tool that's bugging out on me. So many weird things happen. So many situations and edge cases cause things to fail. And if your tools are only kind of half-assed, you're going to have so many problems with them that you're going to get frustrated and check them out. You need the best possible tools that are as solid as possible. So when these weird things kind of happen, it's kind of clear like something's weird. Something weird is going on here. Either I don't have the right mental model or the tool's not doing what it needs to do. So, so we kind of saw that happen there. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I feel like I had to reload to get that. I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. That is a bug in Scaffold ETH, though. I will pass that mm -hmm. on to to uh, the rest of the Scaffold ETH builders, and we'll figure out what's going on. Missing the balance? No, I think it. I think we have it both, right? So someone was saying maybe I was missing this, but we we decrement the balance there, and we increment the balance there, right? Uh, yeah. So what if we didn't decrement, right? We could take that out, and now when I give ten, I keep my ten, and they get their ten, right? You can you can imagine some weird things that you would do with that. Okay, so I'm thinking we're going to have a mapping. If we're going to make a game, we probably want to have a mapping. And maybe it's like a voting. Maybe it's a... Okay, let's, I'm just like thinking of random weird games. Uh, I'm thinking what we could do is we could do a... Uh, can we do a bytes four uh, and have people set their own emoji? This is, this is what I'm thinking here. Let's, and, and you know what? I don't even know if we can do this. So I'm going to deploy it and I'm going to tinker with it. I'm going to find out. Yeah, it didn't like that. Did not like that. Let's get that out of there. What I want to see if, if this works and okay. And then let's, let's do a function that says set. Uh, maybe we're setting our preferences, set emoji. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what, quite what we're doing here. And we'll have a bytes for, and we'll call that the input, and we'll make it public. And for any given message dot sender, we'll let them set their emoji. Totally making this up on the fly, but I'm thinking maybe something like we have a bunch of possible emojis, and then everyone sets their emoji. And then at some time, if someone doesn't have their emoji set to something then we can liquidate them or something like that just randomly thinking of some random games <laughs> and just showing game. you my thought process yeah exactly so we we have the bytes for and we want to say message.sender but i have no idea if we can even do emojis here i don't know if this is going to work i'm thinking through it randomly but scaffolith allows me to kind of like just poke at things and kind of see what's behind the curtains here okay so we have a set emoji function now what are the chances i can do something like Sad guy. Oh, happy. Oh man, it's not even typing them in. Here we go. How do we how do we get this here? There we go. Uh lovey face hit send does not let us do it. Okay, why? Let's see. If that is a bytes, let's make it a string, maybe. Okay. And then let's take it to bytes four. It's probably not gonna let me do this. How about that? Does it let me does it let me do that? If we take in a string and then concatenate it to, oh, that needs to be memory. Another thing that's really hard in blockchain is sometimes the error messages are so cryptic and it's so hard to figure out. It's telling you this thing is wrong and you're focused on why is that thing wrong, but really your mental model is wrong or something with the environment is wrong. Okay, it doesn't let us take a string. Let's see, how could we do... How could we do? Let's just make them strings. Who cares? We're 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 not we're <laughs> we don't care about how expensive things are right now. We're just gonna make these super expensive. Uh, so it's gonna take a lot of gas, but we're gonna we're gonna let you set your string. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe this is maybe this is a follow the leader game. Okay, so maybe the owner will have their string. 
okay? And you can set your emoji, but then there's another function. Ooh, what if we make it payable? Ooh, you have to stake some money when you set your emoji, okay? So let's do something like this. We'll say function stake, okay? And uh, we'll make it public. And here we go, we're gonna make it payable. You have to tell, payable. You have to tell uh, uh, Solidity that this thing is gonna take in some money, okay? And we're gonna we're gonna have some staking variable too, okay? S T A K E. Oop, that's a uh, stake amount. Oh, that's ugly. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're doing this quickly. Uh, there we go. So now we have some kind of U N two fifty six stake amount that comes in, and we're going to wow. Let's let's maybe do if I'm gonna set up. <laughs> like no no conventions here we're throwing everything to the wind here okay so we're gonna say if someone stakes we're gonna have their stake amount for the message dot sender go up by however much they stake okay so this allows someone to stake and and set some emoji okay and this will be your underscore emoji okay and we'll we'll get rid of this uh, we'll kind of put it there. Obviously, you'd want to set a lot of rules here. Have they staked already? Don't let them stake again. Something like that. We'd, we'd bring in some require statements, but let's not worry about that right now. Let's just set the stake amount and the emoji. Uh, uh, let's just even overwrite it. IDK. Uh, and let's let's go ahead and require. Uh, no, nah, I don't want, I don't want to write all the rules. Uh, uh, this is okay. So this is totally going to be a contract that could just fall over if something goes wrong. Let's be clear about that. Like I'm not making this very secure. Making a good secure contract is is going to be a, a lot more work. But I'm going to have a stake function that lets someone send in. Uh, you know what? The amount is going to be the message dot value. Okay. So so someone can send in money and their emoji. And it sets a stake amount for that user and sets their emoji. Then there's some other function called liquidate. Li I, I should leave that in there. Liquidate, okay. And what this does is it's some address, right? So who's the homie we're about to liquidate, okay? And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say we're gonna say uh, if well, let's see. We want to require. So here's the rule we're gonna write. We're gonna say if the emoji of the homie that you're referencing does not equal the emoji of the owner, then you can get liquidated. So it's going to be a follow the leader thing and the owner will set an emoji and all the players have to set their emojis quickly to avoid getting liquidated. I don't know, IDK. What we should do is also put like a timestamp in here and say that there's like a round and at the beginning and end of the round and you can only be liquidated at a certain time. But let's just let's just set it up. Uh, we're gonna require that if you're trying to liquidate some homie, that homie's emoji needs to be not equal to the owner. Uh, this homie is good. That means, that means th this is an error, right? The rule says they have to be different and if they're not different, then, then uh, the homies, the homies, good there. He's not, he's not going to get liquidated. Okay, so assuming that to get to line thirty-eight, the emoji has to be different from the owners. And if the emoji is different from the owners, we're going to let anyone liquidate someone. And what that does is it takes the stake amount, the amount of money they send, and we're going to do what message dot sender dot transfer. And this is not the best way to do this, but I'm just going to do it. Normally, you would use call. So let me just go, it's worth going on the tangent since we're kind of taking things slow and walking through things. Uh, if you go to Solidity by example, fantastic resource for learning uh, uh, Solidity, but they talk about sending, nope, that was not what I wanted, but that's a good one to read. They talk about sending, transfer, and calling. Let me just go ahead and paste this into the chat. So uh, when you transfer or you send, it has a hard-coded gas limit and it throws uh, a little bit differently. If you send to a multi-sig, that multi-sig is a smart contract and it executes a little bit and it uses a little gas. And therefore both of these will just revert. And so if we have some multi-sig that's owned by all the players or like some set of stewards and you try to send to it, it's gonna fail. So you need to use this call function to send ether 
uh, in a smart contract. And I'm actually going to go copy it now. Now that we're here and we're doing it correctly, instead of saying message.sender.transfer, I'm going to do it the correct way. And I'm going to do that. And I'll say message.sender.call. Okay. And I'm going to send them this value. And these, oh, whoop, 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 whoop. and there's some quotes here for there's no call data. So super, super ugly set of lines here. But basically what it says is send the money that was staked from, oh, it needs to be the homie stake because you're liquidating the homie. So we, we liquidate the homie and we send it to whoever does the liquidation. So they're getting paid. They're incentivized to liquidate other homies that don't have their emoji set correctly. IDK, whatever, here we go. Let's let's check and see. I think we almost need like a timestamp here. I feel like a game, oh, 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 oh. let's figure out. Uh, it's called emoji. All right, 1106. If we, I mean, we got time to take this all the way to optimism if we get this thing to work. Let's see, I can't do, uh-oh. That's gonna, that's, that's not good. We need to be able to compare strings. So the emoji of the homie, why can't I compare two strings? Huh, I did not know that. So how do we do string comparison? We're gonna have to Google it and we're gonna have to look at three or four lines deep because there's gonna be some terrible ones probably. Oh, what? Oh, what? Okay, okay, fine. I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna copy this, compare strings. I'm gonna bring this right in. I'm gonna copy paste from the internet and deploy it live. All right. I'm gonna say, it's a perfect example of how it really goes, right? <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You think, you think, oh yeah, I can, I can totally do that. And it does not. Okay, so this needs to be, this is gonna return if they're equal. So I think it needs to be not, right? Let's see if that works. Yeah, that, that, that would have been a huge pain in the ass, right? And say you built the whole thing, right? And now it's like someone else's job to write the test suite and someone else's job to write the front end. You had no idea that was not going to work and now nothing works, right? This, this ability to slowly iterate and kind of try things and figure things out and, and not slowly in terms of slowly as in at your own pace. You're doing this pretty quickly, right? We're, we're iterating on this whole concept of this game. Okay. Now, I think we're ready to deploy. Let's deploy this thing and let's try, uh, let's try a few things and see how it works. So we're going to have uh, a couple players. We've got, we've got red guy over here. Let me even bring up, let's see if I bring up new one of these on localhost, there we go, close this. So we're gonna have a couple players here, okay? We've got, we've got this guy, so what is this guy? Brown guy, we've got brown guy, we've got pink guy. Uh, and then we've got blue guy over here, I think. Let's see. Uh, localhost. Uh, that's, that's, my, that's my address. Actually, what, what can I do here? Could I do a, what if I bring my phone in? I don't know. Nah, we, we won't do that right now. Okay, so uh, I was gonna think, I was thinking I could wallet connect in a player also, but that's, that's for later on. Okay, so what do we have here? So first of all, if I compare A to A, it's true if I say A and B, it's false. Okay, we tested, <laughs> we tested our string compare function from the internet, it works, ship it. Okay, so uh, what we need to do here is we need to allow people to stake. So uh, as the owner, I'm gonna stake first and I'm going to put, let's do rainbow, okay? And uh, as the owner, I don't need to stake any money actually. So I can just say zero and I can hit send, okay. And I can go check the emoji for any player is rainbow. Okay, so the, the, the follow the leader, the leader has set their emoji to rainbow. And in this instant, the rest of the players need to quickly set their emoji to uh, uh, rainbow and stake some money on it. Okay, and if I put that and I do 0 0.01, oh, we need to get some mon money from the faucet take that to ETH and send, there we go. Okay, so he has staked. Okay, so pink guy has staked. Now, if we try to liquidate pink guy, it should fail because it should say that his address, yeah, the homie's good, homie's good. You can't liquidate that homie, he's good. All right, now, as soon as 
I change my emoji to rocket ship, okay? So we're following the leader and the leader has moved to rocket ship. Now anyone can liquidate, okay? So let's grab this guy over here. Let's say he's, he's another player and he checks. Okay, so let's see. We know that the leader, the leader's emoji is rocket ship. And we go check this guy's emoji and it's rainbow. Oh shit, my liquidation bot's tingling. Let's get him, let's get him, let's get him. Okay, so let's see. We want to liquidate that homie right there. Send, it worked. And, and so some really neat things happened here. So what happened is it compared them and sent me his ETH. So I was able to liquidate that other player and receive their ETH. So I actually made money by paying attention and playing the game by the rules, okay? So obviously there's a lot of things. I, I think we have a little bit of extra time. I think I wanna add a timestamp in here. And every time the owner sets it, it resets some timestamp to maybe 15 seconds in the future. So the owner sets their emoji and there's like a 15 second delay between the time when someone else could set their emoji or something like that. Does that make sense? Maybe we should do that just cause like timestamps are good with games. Yeah, Anybody have any like how we doing so far, everyone good. And then well, I'm gonna deploy guess, it to optimism. <laughs> nice, yeah, I think that would yeah? be nice. Yeah, I okay, just want cool. to add that uh, like, it seems like we're creating something like Wolf Game Austin, right? Like Wolf yeah. Game has yep. a very similar yep. feel. Where okay, it's, okay, okay, risk okay. hold on now. Losing something, hold on yeah. now. You got me thinking about that. You're right, you're right. We don't have any randomness in here. Let's let's add a little Wolf Game randomness here. And I'm gonna go to Lugie Tanks. Or no, no, I don't want Lugie Tanks, I want Lugies. Uh, let me see here. I got, I got so many repos in so many different places. Yep, that one's missing. What if I add dash examples? Oh man, let's just go to scaffold ETH. Okay, scaffold ETH, the org. If you go to scaffold ETH, the org. Oh, there we go, scaffold ETH. Oh man. Okay, here we go, scaffold ETH examples. And I go to Lugi tank, a Lugi SVG NFT. Here we go, I'm gonna paste that in here because it's a really fun build of scaffold ETH. Uh, but what I'm going to go to is I'm going to get into the contract because I did a random thing here and I want to grab that randomness. Here we go. Here is how we can get some predictable randomness. Okay. And let's build that into our smart contract. Okay. So when someone liquidates, what I want to do is do a random dice roll and let's do, let's do it on liquidation. Okay. All right. So you're, you're at this point, you're in the liquidation function. You have tried to liquidate someone. And let's say uh, we're gonna get a random number. And the way we're gonna get a random number is we're gonna look at the previous block hash, hashed with uh, our address and the address of the smart contract. And what that will do is bring us back a bytes 32. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a bytes, actually a bytes two, let's see. Ooh, ooh, I'm not exactly sure how this works. What if we wanted to, let's, let's do this first. Let's do this. Let's make a function uh, test and we'll make it public and we'll do this predictable random and we'll console log it, okay? And we'll console log it uh, right there. And really I wanna do maybe predictable random zero. I wanna grab just one byte. Let's see if it lets me do that. And let's save it and let's deploy it and let's go see if this, this works. Uh, actually, we could make this a view function and just return it. returns, uh, what are we gonna return? I think I, mean, I think I want a uint eight, okay? And I think I'm gonna try to type death this, doing a lot of stuff here that's kind of random and weird, uh, but let's try this. What I'm hoping to do is get a nice random number out of there. There's no way this is gonna compile on the first try. Uh, let's go back over here and see, see where it complains. Oh shit. <laughs> Worked first try. Okay, so now we have this randomness function and we can go over and what do I call it, test? Can we call test? It's, it's 154 right now. Uh, it's hard to see, it's right down here, uh, kind of in the bottom there, ooh. Okay, and that's gonna change every time. If I go to the faucet and I make another transaction, this uh, randomness is gonna change. Now it's 194. Uh, it's gonna be a random number between zero and 255. Now it's 225, okay? So we've got a number. We've got a random number and we know how to grab it. And it's gonna look at the previous block hash just like Wolf Game does. Uh, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna say big if statement here. 
we're going to say if this random number is greater than let's make it maybe like half and half or maybe it's greater than 200 about one one fifth of the time one fifth of the time you will hit this condition and instead of sending you the money right let's go back over to this instead of sending you the money okay we're gonna send it somewhere else i don't i don't know where okay so there's there's two different conditions here when you go to liquidate and all the conditions are correct and you're able to liquidate someone, we're gonna roll the dice. And one fifth of the time, we're gonna send the money to the owner. And the rest of the time, we're gonna send it to the sender. So total like wolf gamey thing where you try to make a sheep and instead it mints a wolf or you try to do something and something else happens. We're kind of rolling the dice and adding a little game mechanic here that when you do liquidate, sometimes maybe it goes somewhere else. Sometimes maybe it liquidates you. Who knows exactly what's going on? Okay, so here we go. Let's see if this works. Let's go ahead and deploy it. Who knows if this is gonna work? It is, it's working. Okay, so we've added another like kind of interesting little twist to our game, right? Uh, the last thing we should do is timestamps. I really think we should build timestamps in here just because so many games are based on timestamps so often. Uh, so the way you do that is uh, when, let's see, on stake, Okay, we're gonna say if message dot sender equals equals the owner. So this would be if the owner has updated their emoji, we're going to keep track of a new variable, which is a uint 256 public uh, uh, last time. We'll call it last time, okay? And we're gonna set that last time equal to the block dot timestamp, okay? Let's just go play around with that and make sure it works, make sure it compiles. Let's push it out to scaffold ETH and let's tinker with it. Okay, let's see. I think we're done. I even got my randomness, so I'm done with that window. All right, let's see if, let me reload, get a nice fresh view here. Uh, if I go and I stake and I set my first emoji to wave and I am the owner and I hit send, now, when we go check last time, it should be updated, right? Let's do that again. Uh, I'll set my emoji to sad guy. Okay, so it's what, 079. Now, if I hit that again, 091, see that? Okay, so the time, the timestamp is keeping track of the last time it was uh, set up. So what we need is a little safety check in the liquidate. And we need to require that, what is it gonna be? It's gonna be block.timestamp has to be after, needs to be greater than our last time plus some buffer. Maybe you get, maybe you get 30 seconds or something. Maybe you get 15, I'll give you 15 seconds. So, so the only way you can get past this is if the current time is 15 seconds after the other guy's time, okay? So, so the, the, the owner, let's do 30 seconds, let's deploy it. So we added a new rule. Oh, we should probably say uh, not yet or something can't liquidate yet something along those lines what's this uh what do we got here compare strings that can be ooh it can be immutable that mean yeah that must be oh pure public pure right does that get rid of that warning these warnings since we're writing code that is like reinventing financial mechanisms and people are putting millions of dollars pay attention to your warnings there's another hint there that you might your mental model might be a little bit off right Okay, I think that our game is basically ready, uh, but let's, let, okay, so one thing I wanna show is timestamps. Timestamps are a little weird locally, and they're gonna get even weirder when we go to optimism for a little bit. Uh, a good, a good uh, maybe, yeah, we, we, we could go to maybe Covan first, right? So, so once you're at this point, you've got your game working pretty well, you're gonna wanna push it to uh, a, a different public network. Maybe we'll go to Covan first where the timestamps update every five seconds. What I wanna show here is that the block.timestamp, let's, let's even make a read function that shows the block.timestamp. I have a question, Austin, from Guillermo that uh, isn't block time in milliseconds. Yeah. It probably is. We're, we're going to find out right now. Yeah. I think it's actually in seconds, though. But how do you find out? You open up Scaffold ETH, 
and you build a little pure function right here called stamp and you push it out and then you go to the front end and you look at it and you see what it is. Oh man, I broke it. Uh, oh, I can't, that meant can't be pure. It needs to be view. But this is such a good way to tinker with it and figure it out, right? Like what, what is the timestamp actually? Well, now we have a time emoji. There it is, it's all the way down at the bottom. It's 248. What you'll notice is this is not updating. I can hit reload as many times as I want. And I'm not getting a fresh time. The reason for that is locally, there's no transactions firing. So there's the timestamp isn't updating. So in the case of working locally, your timestamp will need you to trigger something like a transaction. Now watch this. After I make this transaction, this timestamp is going to, oh, we can't see it because this guy's in the way. But now that timestamp is going to be updated. Every time I make a transaction, we'll get a new, and if we reload this, it's only a couple seconds. Yeah, so it's seconds, not milliseconds. So we've, we've answered a few of our questions here, right? We've, we, we know this is in seconds. Uh, so my plus 30 works, right? And we also know that time is a little weird on localhost. Uh, but we basically have our game. I think it's built and ready to go. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that we should go to Covan first. So let's go to a test net and let's play with it there. All right, so you're ready to deploy. What, what are the next steps? If you go to scaffold ETH, okay, so also you should build a front end. <laughs> you should not make your users use this as their front end. You can see an example UI of how you can go about wiring up buttons and, and, and keeping state and a lot of the things you need to do. These different buttons do different things. And if we go look at, I'll go look at that real quick just to show it off. Uh, example UI. Here's a nice example UI that shows you, here's how you make a button. When someone clicks that button, it's going to uh, write to the contract your new purpose. And when that update comes back, it's going to do some stuff where it console logs, right? And, and you can scroll through here and find all these different elements and, and how I went about building each one of these different buttons. Uh, there's even events here with each, ooh, we should, you, we should add events. Our front end is going to need some events. I should have done that. I, it's, I feel like we're kind of like, if I, if I go too far into this, you'll notice that every time someone sets the purpose here, a new event shows up. And events are a great way for your front end to kind of keep track of what's going on on chain. Events are like cheap on-chain on storage. The gotcha there is a smart contract can't read another smart contract's events. So if you, need to, if you need to have some value that changes the logic of another smart contract, it needs to be stored on chain, not in an event. But uh, these events allow us to have a nice front end that, that allows us to keep track of not just what the current purpose was, but we can kind of see the history of the purpose by listening to those events. In this case, for this game, Obviously, we'd want to have events for people setting their, their uh, stuff. We want to have events for all of this stuff so we can see it on the screen, like all this massive multiplayer stuff going on. I'm not going to dive into it. We're going to, we got to cut it short. We can't go that long. Okay. You've built, let's, let's pretend we've got our game functionality done with this process of tinkering with our smart contract. Then we've built out a UI that is super smooth and pretty and you can connect your wallet in and you can see what the owner's emoji is and you can see, oh, he switched it and the time is running down. Now you only have 15 seconds and you need to set your emoji in stake really quick, right? We'll have, let's pretend like there's a, a UI built for that. Some React whiz, right? Like any Web2 guy should be able to step in and handle that. Guy or girl, of course. I keep saying guy, but I mean it in like the dude kind of generic SER kind of way. Sirs, sirs, thank you for building sirs. Here we go. Uh, what do we do to deploy? We've got our app, we've got everything ready, we've tinkered with Scaffold ETH. Let's go to production. What does it take? So you can't deploy. So when I do this yarn deploy here, it's actually deploying it as uh, this, this user right here, which is the, the hard hat user. When we get our hard hat chain, it gives us a whole bunch of wallets that are just full of an insane amount of ETH, right? But that's not going to work on production because we can't just like have someone else deploy our contract. We have to pay real money to make this thing go, right? So what I'm getting at here is you're gonna to need to build a deployer account. So I'm gonna do a yarn generate. And this is all in the scaffold ETH docs. Uh, as, as you get through this, it talks through how you deploy to production. Uh, it's also, if you go to speedrun Ethereum, that very first NFT challenge that Paul is talking about is gonna take you through how to go from zero to one and actually deploy an app on a test net. So these challenges will take you through this, but 
uh, yarn generate. Yarn generate is going to create a mnemonic in my file system. And then if I do a yarn account, it's going to list that mnemonic and tell me all the different networks that I have value on. Now I'm going to pull out my punk wallet. Punk wallet is a burner wallet. It's a web wallet built with scaffold ETH uh, and it works on any different network. I'm gonna put it, it works on any EVM compatible network. I'm gonna go with Covan at first, right? So I've got that set to Covan now and I'm going to scan this address and I'm going to send, I don't know, a hundred bucks of Covan, hundred dollars worth of Covan uh, to this user. Sent. Okay, so now after five seconds, my deployer has some money. He's ready to deploy this. Uh, here we go. So if I do a yarn deploy, now I'm gonna add one extra thing here. I'm gonna say network is COVID, okay? And please work first try. We're deploying to a public network. Please, please work. Okay, it's taking a little oh, longer, yeah. right? It's a little slower. I think Coven was actually down earlier. Ah, it deployed perfectly. Okay, mm -hmm. so we had to yarn generate and we had to push it out to, we had to deploy it to a new network. And there's one other change you need to go to production. This is one of the biggest strengths of Scaffold ETH. Watch this, I'm gonna go from localhost to Covan by changing one thing. Now, when I hit save, my app is now pointed at Covan. And that's all I had to do to take my local front end and point it at Covan. Now, what happens when I go look at my contract? There is my contract out on Covan, okay? And what happens if I like click on this address right here? Going back to Scaffold ETH has all these handy components you're gonna use. If you're on the wrong network, it's gonna hint that. If I hit this, it's going to take us to, it did not. <laughs> if I hit this, it's gonna take us to Covan Etherscan. So all of the addresses except for that one because we just put that in and I forgot to add the, the block explorer to it. Almost all the addresses that you encounter in Scaffold ETH can be clicked on and take you to the, the specific network that you have selected. So there, there is this address on Covan. And if I switch it to Optimism, then all of that stuff switches to Optimism, except for the lazy programmer, me, did not remember to put the block explorer in there. So this one's not following that, that but it usually should take you to your network. All you have to do is change that one thing. Okay, so we're on Covan. Uh, we are the owner. We have plenty of Covan ETH. Uh, let's go ahead and set uh, our emoji to the sun emoji. And we're making a real transaction now. Notice we have block natives notify here. We're actually writing something on chain. We're seeing transactions happen. There the transaction succeeded. We can go to the Coven block explorer and see that we actually did update this. Okay. Now let's bring in a second player, right? So second player is here, reloads. They don't have any Coven ETH. So let me send them some Coven ETH real quick. Uh, with my burner wallet. So go ahead and scan that address and send them, I don't know, $50 of Covan. And five seconds later, they should get it. Uh, wait, did I do it? Oh yeah, it succeeded. Okay. Uh, there, there it is. Okay. So we've got our $50. Uh, now, if I want to stake, so I'm going to say, what, what's our emoji? Was it the sun? I think it was the sun. Uh, and I'm going to stake, you know, 0 0.001 ETH on that and send. And another transaction happens, right? We actually paid uh, to make that work and it goes through. Okay, now let's say if you wanted to try to liquidate that person, it should fail, right? It should tell us you can't liquidate that homie because, oh, it fails due to an exception. It doesn't give us, it 100% should give us that. Ooh, that is another good scaffold ETH bug. We're finding some good scaffold ETH bugs today. <laughs> that should say something about homie is good or something like that, right? Something about that, something about the Covan network was different enough from the hard hat network that yeah. when this when this error fired, uh, we weren't able to to set it. I don't know why that didn't go through. But another thing to fix on scaffold ETH. Go ahead, Paul. No, yeah, I was saying something to point out that even if it's on a testnet and on local hosts, there are differences like that, mm -hmm. like what you just saw, Austin. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So let's let's have someone uh, not follow along, right? Let's say they stake on this and they send in point 
Let's see, how much money do we have? Oh, we don't have any. Got to send some Coven to this guy too. Okay, here we go. Oh, ooh, now is a good time. No, I can't connect my wallet. Ooh, I could wallet connect. Watch this. Okay, huh? wallet connect. All right, so now I'm just going to use my punk wallet and I'm going to actually log in as my punk wallet. I'm going to hit that same scanner button. I'm going to hit allow, but I'm going to scan the wallet connect. Okay, and there we go. Now I'm logged in as, ooh, except I don't see the address there. Something is not right. Hmm. Hmm, let's see what happens. Let's try to stake 0 0.1 and take that to that and see if it triggers a transaction over here. Nope, uh, something's wrong with my wallet connect. Man, th th I don't know if that's an error with wallet connect. Let, here, let's, let me use my rainbow wallet. Well, I probably don't have any Covan. Let's just use burner wallets. I'm trying to get too fancy. Uh, let's send this, let's go ahead. Yeah, so make sure that dude is out. Let's send this dude some Covan real quick so he's got some. Uh, and what we want to do is have a, a liquidation event, right? right? We can do that even easier. Let's just, as the owner, let's update our value to wave and let's send it. Okay. Now, if we try to liquidate, it's going to fail for 30 seconds, right? We basically have a 30 second window between when uh, uh, we can liquidate or not. So let's see if this goes. And also this should be this should be keeping up, right? Every five seconds or so, I'm just gonna kind of wail on that. There we go. Oh, look at that timestamp updating with each new block on Covan, which is perfect for, uh, and actually this isn't working on Optimism yet, but it's going to be working in like the next few days, Optimism is gonna deploy it and the timestamp is gonna work. Uh, but, so we've got our live, uh, let's see, can we liquidate this person? Oh, it let us. Uh, Oh, I think they got liquidated. <laughs> I it's hard to oh, you know, we need we need an ether scan, right? Let's go, let's go look at our ether scan and look at that liquidation that we just put out there. It wasn't 51 seconds ago, was it? What did we call? Uh what I want to see is like ETH moving from I think I think Coven's a little behind. I think we're waiting for there. No, no. There it is, 26 seconds ago. There, there we go. There we go. Transfer. Boy, you can't see it. But if I zoom in, the liquidation event happened and it transferred the 0 0.001 from the contract to this address, which is us, but also, okay, so we liquidated it as the owner. So I can't tell which random role we got. I can't tell if we rolled the owner gets it or the owner gets it because the owner was the only one that got it. Okay, our game is ready for optimism. We've tested it on a live network. We're ready to deploy to optimism. So what we need to do, uh, we need to do a yarn account, right? We need to get that QR code back and we need to put some real money in it. I'm gonna put some real live money in this thing right now using my punk wallet on Optimism. What's this gonna cost? Maybe $30, $40 to deploy? I don't know. Let's put, <laughs> I'm gonna put- Some paid expenses. Put 50, yeah, it could be, yeah. yeah. I'm, gonna put, I'm gonna put $50 into this account. Okay, so I'm sending $50 of optimism. It's gonna cost me a buck or two. Uh, we can even go look at this dude on optimism. Ooh, wait, we want optimism. Uh, ether scan? What are we doing on time? About 30 minutes left, we're okay. We have plenty of time, okay. Yeah, there we go. So he now has $50 on optimism. Let's look at that transaction. We were talking about this earlier. What did it cost me? It cost me $1.35 to send that $50. And it happened like basically as fast as the network can process it. It happened basically instantaneously at you know, time, time for network pros, propagation and the verifier or whatever that thing is. IDK, not a, not a brain, not a, not a giga brain. But we are ready now. And I'm gonna do a yarn deploy to a live network paying live real money. Please work. Here we go. Let's find out what happens here. And how much is it going to cost to deploy this contract too? We're going to find out. There it is. It's deployed. We just oh, deployed that. <laughs> it's so fast. <laughs> yep. It costs us $20. So it costs us $20 to put this game on optimism. And it costs you, the player, about a dollar for every interaction that you make with a smart contract. So obviously, like if you're going to have if you need things to cost like five cents, you need to be over on something more side chainy or more uh like polygon or side chainy. Uh, Gnosis chain, 
L2 sidechain combination polygon. I don't want to get in that conversation either, <laughs> but there are other L2 alternatives that are cheaper than this. But for me, uh, optimism is probably the one that I'm thinking is going to be where I deploy my next game. And this dollar and you know twenty dollars for a smart contract, dollar for an interaction is about the price point. Okay. So now our app is live. And remember, we have to make one other change in our app JSX. We need to change that uh, network to optimism, right? All right. And now our app should be live on optimism. Now, we need to deploy this thing so people can play the game, right? So I'm going to do a yarn build. I'm going to get that started. And what that's going to do is it's it's your, it's your, your classic, like you've got a React app and you're building the static version of it to deploy it. What I'll do is I'll deploy this to a live URL and we can all kind of play this game together uh, in the in the closing uh, minutes here. But don't don't come play this game because we're playing it for real money on optimism. And gosh, maybe there's like gambling risk here because there's a random number in it. I, I do I do not know the legal implications of, of what we just hacked together and we're about to go play. Please don't get me thrown in the slammer for this. Uh, here, we, here we go though. Uh, we, we should have an app being built. Uh, I am the owner. I'm gonna go ahead and set the emoji. Uh, we gotta do like fire emoji, right? Fire emoji is a classic. All right, and I'm gonna send that transaction. Ooh, I don't have any money. Okay, yep, this dude needs some optimism also. Any questions? How are we doing so far? Anybody have any like, at this point, we can kind of like, I'm, I'm gonna play the game out and we can talk about it some more, but it's more of just like Q and A and stuff. If you guys wanna ask questions, hey, uh, um, feel free. I've got a question about, I uh, saw so you are using Archimi, Archimi, Archimi. And um, I was, I never deployed to mainnet. So I don't know, do you really need to use Infra or Archimi if you want to deploy? So, so, the, these providers are what they're called. When you when you get in and start learning Web three, uh, pick up ethers.js first and learn providers and signers and wallets. Uh, what we're talking about here is the provider, and that's your connection to the internet. Now, technically, you can run right here. This is an ETH two node running back behind me. You can run your own node pretty easily. You can fire up your own node, a Geth or whatever, and it, it talks to peers, peer to peer, and you can actually point your app at that local node and you can run it on your local node. And that's really the most decentralized way to do it. But most folks don't do that. Most folks don't, don't wanna have their own ETH node running locally. So that's why we have these providers. So you're saying, I think you're saying if you're going to deploy, do you need, you, you do need to, if you need to talk to some connection to the blockchain, right? Guess, and you can talk to any node on the network. Yep, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I guess my question is, is there a public Ethereum Foundation node that we can talk to directly? That's that's basically what, what Infura is. Not, not Ethereum Foundation, but like basically there are tons of services now, even Scaffold ETH runs its own, right? So Scaffold ETH has its own RPC where I just have a server set up and a geth node and you can actually deploy a contract by sending a signed transaction to my node and my node will put it on for you so so it, it really like depends on what you need and where you need it but you're always going to have to have some kind of connection to the chain to be able to get yeah. your signed transactions into the mempool and, and into the blockchain does that make sense so see so we're using any one of these pocket alchemy infura our own and, and we, we want to let the user kind of choose which ones they want. We don't want to kind of king make there. But really what we want to do is kind of like load balance across the two, right? Check, check four different endpoints, figure out what their current block is, and take the one or even take a, a committee of them and they're all voting, right? But that's, that's like way headier and way more decentralized. But I think the short answer to that is yes, you need some connection to the blockchain, whether you run your own node or you go to Alchemy or you go to Infura, someone needs to be your connection to the blockchain. Does that make sense? Yep. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, okay. Thanks, now Austin. our and app. Yeah. We have one question yeah. from Craig, uh, which is how does Scaffold ETH handle multi-contract setups? Okay. Yep. Uh, so as we add more contracts uh, up here, uh, let's see, where is it? Hard hat. 
contracts. We can add multiple contracts here, and those artifacts are all going to get injected into the front end. So you just create a new contract here, and then in the front end, you may want to, uh, there's a contract component. So this, this, this component right here is that thing that's rendering this nice adaptive contract. So if you create a new contract in Hardhat and you compile and deploy it with your deploy script, right? So there's for your contract, you'll probably copy that to a new file, deploy your new contract. And then in the front end, you'll change this and you'll add another one of these components too. So you basically add a new contract to Hardhat, add the deployer script, and then add it into the front end so it shows up here. And that's that's what you have to do to add more contracts. Hopefully that, Ooh, that covers yeah. it. Follow the leader. OK, emoji, follow the leader dot surge. We're deploying our game that we totally just made up, and it's totally insecure. But it shows kind of some fun, massive multiplayer things, including liquidation, which is, which is kind of a neat thing, right? Uh, ooh, cron jobs. It, we're, we're an hour and 40 minutes into the talk, and I haven't talked about cron jobs yet. But if you're a Web2 builder, you understand that cron jobs are sort of like these automated processes. You can't do that on blockchain. There's no automatic process. Everything is a transaction. Everything has to be poked. Uh, at first, you think, well, I could run a cron job by having some server and have that server check into my smart contract. Uh, that is super centralized, and your server can fall over. If you want to build a decentralized cron job, the way you do it is with these rules in this smart contract. You build a function that anyone can call, and you build a rule that says this can only be called once every 24 hours, and you build an incentive. An incentive is the key part. You build an incentive where the economics work out, where if someone hits that button, they make 5, 10, 15 bucks, right? Like plus, like you pay for their gas and some, right? So say gas is $10, make sure this the reward is $25 or something like that. That's how you build a decentralized cron job. You make it so anyone can access it. You write the rules correctly. And then you incentivize someone to poke that thing every 24 hours. And if you do it correctly, someone's always going to poke that thing. So like 30 people are going to build different scripts that try to race to get to get that, get that money and make a little money each day. So thinking through how your games work, they need to be kind of this always on asynchronous kind of thing. Thinking of cron jobs, thinking of liquidations. Uh, let's say you have an animal in your game and your animal is eating, your animal can't just run out of food and die. There's no, there's no, it ran out of food and die. It, it, it dies, it, it has to be poked. Someone has to be watching the contract and say, ooh, ooh, this character is about to run out of food. Okay, I send a transaction to liquidate that thing and kill their, their character and I get paid for it, right? Again, a massive multiplayer, always on adversarial network where you only have to trust the code. That's the kind of stuff we're building here. Okay, so I think we should have emoji follow the leader. Let's see what happens. Ooh, I kind of want that. I kind of want that local host one because it has my optimism on it. Okay, let's do this. Uh, let's create a new tab. Let's go to local host. I'm gonna send the uh, the ETH from, ooh. <laughs> I think I just lost, I, did that? Did I just lose $50? I think I may have destroyed the burner wallet that had $50 of optimism oh, on no. it. Ah, oh, whoops. Oh, man. Uh, it's possible. It's totally possible. Okay. I don't know. Maybe that was on Covan too. Yeah, maybe that was over on Covan. Okay, anyways, let's let's give this guy a little bit of optimism. So, so anybody at home, you guys can go play this now. Uh, emoji follow the leader. Don't. It's going to cost money. Don't do it. But you can if you want to. Uh, you need optimism. First of all, you'll need some some optimistic ETH. But uh, let's let's play one round of the game here uh, in the closing uh, minutes here. So I'm going to go ahead and send this player a little bit of optimism. OK, uh, $20 should do it. OK, and then I'm going to create. Uh, let's see, can I create another player? uh sure 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 what's that address emoji follow the leader so this is in safari right and i'm going to send this person some eth too let's see uh eth also okay send this dude five bucks okay so we've got some players in the game now this guy should eventually have five dollars yep so he has five dollars Okay. Gosh, is this gambling? I feel, I feel like this is like, this is a bad, <laughs> oh man, 
when they have like yeah, the just, gaming commission the, calling me out. Just made the gambling <laughs> app. Yeah. <laughs> right. Whoops. Okay, so this guy is the leader, and the game is follow the leader. And this guy updates his stake, and we can actually see the leader's emoji at any time, right? Oh, nope, it's not set yet. There we go. Now it's set, right? There we go. Oh, he cost, costs a dollar. Got, uh, every move costs a dollar here. So we have to be like, okay, so now the, uh, and, we, and we have the last time. So we have about 30 seconds right now to set our emoji before we lose. And I'm going to have, I'm going to have the $20 one do this. So the $20 one is going to stake uh, a fire and they're going to stake a 0 0.0. Let's see, how much do we have? We have 0 0.002. Okay. And do that and send. Okay. So it's going to cost us some money and we're going to stake point. There we go. There we go. So it costs us about a buck and we staked about $7, right? So we staked seven bucks in this thing saying that we are fire. And if you go check, okay, so now this is the liquidator, okay? And this liquidator is watching, what is the emoji for this dude? Okay, it's fire, what is the emoji for this dude? Okay, it's fire, he's good to go. There's nothing we can liquidate on, right? All right, here it comes. Now the owner, we're playing follow the leader, he sets his to fish, okay? And he spends a dollar, now we're down to $8 there. Yep, okay. And now the liquidator is watching close and he says, ooh, he's, he changed the fish. Go get this guy's. His is different. Ooh, whoops. I think, I think there's something about you need to reload to get a fresh uh, emoji. That was happening earlier. Wait, I'm doing the wrong address. That's what's going on. There we go. Okay. He notices an opportunity here, right? This, this, this player is not following the leader. He waits the 30 seconds, right? If we tried to do it within the 30 seconds, it would fail. And then, all right, so we have $5. We're going to, and anybody out there, if you guys all have, if you guys could be ruining my presentation right now. If you paste in this guy's address, you could liquidate it, right? Anyone with a dollar worth of optimism could liquidate this guy right now because of the rules that we wrote into the smart contract. So the rules of the game say, if you're 30 seconds behind the fall of the leader, you can get liquidated. And here we go, let's see what happens. Oh no, unpredictable gas limit. That's not good. But usually that means that it can't, liquidate it oh oh um okay one other thing what time is it on optimism uh the the time stamp on optimism is not updating with the blocks what we'll do if we if we're watching this right now this is a nice little tool i built with scaffold ETH in 10 minutes we're watching as the blocks go right so now it's at 94 notice the timestamp didn't change this specific issue is about to get fixed on optimism and it basically opens up the the uh design space for a ton of games once you have a live updating timestamp, you can have like players moving around and kind of changing path and changing course with each new transaction we don't have that right now so i'm guessing that this is going to fail until this timestamp updates even though it'll update and it'll be five minutes past it needs to get past that 30 second window. We've got that 30 second boundary and it hasn't changed yet. So we're basically waiting for this to change before we can liquidate this guy. Yeah, can't lick wet. Yeah, can't lick yet. Look at this, look at this terrible giant error, but really it should just show us this, right? So what's going on here is the timestamp hasn't changed yet. And we're waiting for the timestamp on uh, optimism to change. And then we will be able to liquidate this dude. But we Does can't. that ever change, Austin, or is it that? It will. The yes, it should change. It should change within the next couple minutes. We should see this change, and we should be able to up, uh, liquidate this guy. So yeah, let's let's open it up for questions now. Let's just like shoot 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 the stuff for a little bit. We still have twenty eight participants. I think we started with sixty. Uh, <laughs> I I bored everybody out of here. We got ten minutes, so <laughs> I'm open to questions. I'll be in People have to go, pop go in and off. Yeah, but, yep. uh, but yeah, thank you, Austin. I. I I appreciate I've learned so much also today and uh, I guess just want to voice out to everyone that what Austin did not not all of us will be able to do it initially of course Austin has been doing this for years and uh, and uh, he's able to create a game in in just the whole session that we were together so that's not the expectation with uh, the Colonel the fellows of course right like uh, we'll, we'll build up to this and and that but if you're able to follow along you, you've been able to do a little bit already and start making a game so uh, 
So yeah, it was an incredible session. And if there's any questions, so please go on and unmute if you want to. I'll paste I'll, in my Twitter here too. Oh, go ahead, please. I'll just look through the chat as well. If there's anything. Okay. This. Yeah, I'm gonna post my Twitter. I've open DMs. If you have something you'd like to ask privately, that's 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 my open DMs. Oh, I think our timestamp updated. I think we're ready to liquidate. Oh, what's gonna happen? All right, so we have five dollars. Now we have ten dollars. We did it. <laughs> we nice. were able to liquidate that player because their emoji was behind enough and it was not equal. And we started with $5. We spent a dollar, but then we made $6 back from the liquidation. So we're, mm -hmm. we were financially incentivized to liquidate. Ooh, yeah. I think I Cynthia guess. has a hand up. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, go ahead, Cynthia. Hi, thank you. That was great. Um, you mentioned a few times that we may want to be uh, cautious of security issues. Is there a good resource you, you may have to go through some things that we should keep in mind whenever we deploy something like this? The, the first thing I always showed off is uh, with that counter I had, uh, in versions of Solidity before version eight, you could underflow. So you would have five, four, three, two, one. And when it got to zero, if I subtracted one from zero, all the bits were basically zeros, they would go high. So you would get you would get overflow and it would it would roll over. And so your counters would be would be susceptible to this issue of overflow. So overflow was one of the first things, if you could figure out how to subtract one from zero, you could basically have a balance of infinity. And so some people were able to exploit that. So I think going, going you know, digging into that, pulling that thread a little bit more, you wanna look at all the things that other people were able to exploit contracts. Like look at all the other attacks and I'm going to put Solidity, I, I, I mentioned Solidity by example a couple times. I want to put that into the chat because it's such a, a good resource. Uh, I can't find the chat. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but if you go to Solidity by examples, there's a bunch of good applications, but get down here to the hacks and look through and understand each one of these hacks. Um, maybe we, we talk through a reentrancy real quick. Uh, denial of service, source of randomness, delegate call is super scary, uh, self-destruct, can send funds, front running is just like MEV, uh, like transaction pool stuff. Just the way that this whole system mechanically works, not mechanically, there's no mechanics here. The, the way this whole system works, the mechanics of it, you'll, you'll need to understand all these edge cases. Let's talk about reentrancy just for a second. And I can do it with a smart contract here. Okay, so let's say, uh, let's see, this liquidate function. Yeah, uh, uh, you could re-enter it. Okay, so let's say something like this. Let's say there's a function called withdraw, okay? And I'm just gonna do kind of pseudo code here. But let's say in the function, we do something like uh, send them their money and then we decrement their balance. I have no idea if that's the right way to spell that. Their balance, is it even, okay? So if we do things in this order, basically this is the wrong order. This, this, will, this is gonna get us in a lot of trouble. And, and let me explain why. So someone calls a withdraw function and we send them their money and we decrement their balance. It all works in that one transaction, it's fine. We test it locally, someone hits withdraw, they get their money and we say, all right, you know, we're Austin, we're shipping things quick, ship it to the, ship it to the mainnet, okay? Well, on mainnet, people are gonna see this. They're gonna see your code, it's gonna be open. You need your code to be open or it's even worse. Like sec security by obscurity in Ethereum does not work, <laughs> not, not allowed. So people are gonna find it, there is no obscurity, right? Uh, so let's say that this is on mainnet and I'm about to, withdraw this money. Okay. Let's say, let's say the whole contract holds a thousand dollars. Okay. And let's say I have uh, recently deposited just $10. Okay. So I've deposited $10. There's a thousand dollars in the contract, my balance, right? If we were to check my balance, it would be 10. If we said, what is Austin's balance? It's 10. Okay. And so if I were to withdraw, it would send me the 10 and it would set the balance to zero. And then if I called withdraw again, my balance would be zero and it, it would be fine, right? Everything's working so far. Here's the trick. If I deploy an attacker smart contract, okay? So I'm gonna deploy another smart contract. And in that smart contract is what's called the fallback function or the receive function. And that function 
executes when it receives funds. If I go to a smart contract and I send it $10, it's going to execute its fallback function. Okay. So I've got an attacker, I've got an attacking contract with a fallback function who's calling the withdraw function. Okay. So here's, here's how it works. Here's how I play out the attack. As the attacker contract, I deposit $10. Okay. So the balance, let's say, goes up to 1,010 for some reason. Okay. Now I call withdraw on your contract and your contract sends me the money. And right at that moment, we land here in my other contract. So these are two contracts. Try to think of these kind of as separate contracts. This is, you know, contract A, this is attacker contract, contract B. Contract A, when contract A sends me the money, it's gonna trigger this function in contract B. And what I do at this moment is I'm gonna call contract A dot withdraw again, okay? And then it's gonna get into this function again. It's gonna send me the money again. So now we're at 100, now we're at 99, right? Okay, and then it's gonna land here again and I'm gonna call withdraw again and the balance is gonna to go to 980. And then you're gonna send me that money and I'm gonna call withdraw and it's gonna to go to 970. So within this atomic, one line of execution, I'm looping and I'm watching how much gas do I have left. I'm, I'm looking at gas. And if I still have gas left, I'm going to continue to extract from your function because you put these things in the wrong order. And I'm able to never get to the part where you decrement my balance because every time you send me some, I'm just calling withdraw again. So this is a reentrancy attack, and this is how the DAO got drained. This is there's a lot there's a lot of attacks uh, historically. And guess what? Here's, here's the fix. Here's the fix. Before you do anything externally, before you send anything to anyone, any external, con uh, even minting, be careful. In NFTs, there's a safe mint function that checks a receiver function. Don't mint, don't send, don't do anything externally until after you set their balance to zero or you decrement their balance. Okay. And let's say, let's say now it's in this order real quick and let's walk through it. So I deposit $10, just fine. I call withdraw, just fine. Uh, the first thing it does is decrement my balance, okay? And then, then it calls this send function. And when it calls this send function, I call withdraw and my balance is already decremented and it doesn't work. You can't extract any money from that. So this is just an example of reentrancy, an example of one simple attack. You'll wanna look through all of them but you just learn these rules as you go. Now, other things to add to that, you wanna have some good tests. You wanna write a ton of tests, all the different edge cases. If I put money in, can I get money out? If I do this, does this work? You wanna test everything you can possibly test. You also wanna have an auditor look at it. You wanna have an auditor look line by line, what is happening here? And an auditor is gonna tell you things right away like this. He's, he's gonna see, he or she is gonna see this right away and say, oh, that's re and they're gonna get goosebumps. Anytime they see delegate call, anytime they see some of these, these things that look like you know, you know, private data, nothing is private on a public blockchain, right? So, so auditors are extra trained at how to watch out for these things, but you as the builder will just kind of learn what to watch out for. And that's just an example of something that you can do. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Hopefully that, that's a very long-winded way to explain what to look out for, but that's, that that's was the great. best way to That was it. great, thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, how, anything? Okay, how do, yep, go ahead. Please. How do we find auditors? How prevalent are they? <laughs> yeah. We have a channel so in Kernel hard. also, yeah. David, yep. that, that uh, the, the security channel, I think, uh, I forgot who they were called, but we have a, a group that will audit some of the contracts. But of course, the good auditors, uh, there's, there's so much work to go around, right? So they're, they're basically super busy. They're, so, they're making yeah. 10 grand a week. Like they're making a <laughs> yeah. shitload of money. Yeah, and exactly. it's so yeah. hard to find them. Like, so one, like, because it's so hard to find them, I recommend getting more friends that are into smart contracts and getting in telegram groups and discords where there are smart contract devs hanging out. And you can say, hey, I'm thinking about deploying this NFT next week. Come look at my contract and you'll get some people to, to give you feedback. There's, there's a lot of things where you can deploy a smaller version and see how it works, right? Set a bunch of limits on it so the thing can't, you know, can't blow up and, and get crazy and it only can hold $100 or something in it. But 
make friends, make friends with Solidity people and, and float your contracts to them and, and help them out too, right? That, that little reentrancy thing, look for that in the next contract you see and figure out is reentrancy an issue and, and help people out. The last thing I wanted to show, uh, if you go to the scaffold ETH org, now that we have this kind of template for building apps quickly, you kind of experienced how quickly we can build things. A lot of other people have built a lot of other things and you'll want to get in here and just look at these branches. Let me, let me actually just do active and paste that into the chat. Uh, look at all these cool things that you can fork. There's all these forkable examples, that wallet, for instance, uh, a ZK game, a multi-sig, uh, something on Matic, who knows what that is, like NFTs, uh, apps. So there's tons of forkable examples that you can grab off the shelf from Scaffold ETH and use uh, in your next app. If you're thinking of building something, look, look here first and see if you can find an example of something close to it so you don't have to completely start from scratch. And also tell your dev friends to speed run Ethereum. I, I need to jam that to everyone and make sure I mean that into existence. If you're looking to get into speed, if you're looking to get into Ethereum, if you're looking to get into Web3, if you're a Web2 builder, a lot of your knowledge is gonna translate, go speed run Ethereum. Pull, pull down scaffold ETH, get the basic concepts and then start taking on these challenges. They'll take you through what Ethereum is really good at. And they'll show you that how to build a staking app and how to set it up so no one can grief each other, no one can steal each other's money, how to make it secure. So, so go speed run Ethereum after you check out Scaffold ETH. Boop, boop. Doo, doo, doo. Nice. Any more questions? <laughs> Thank you very much, Austin. Uh, you spent more time with us than, than was- uh, I'm hungry, it's time uh, to get allocated. some food. Yeah. So, so <laughs> thank you for that. And, uh, and again, uh, I guess just to to point out to everyone that uh, that the gaming, I guess gaming really uh, goes through a lot of. Um, isn't just for the games that we know. Uh, Austin actually, the, the game you created reminds me of like uh, what the lending protocols do, right? Which is incentivizing when someone is liquidated and finding it. So you actually yep. also created a lending protocol out there. So, so, <laughs> At least the yeah. liquidation side. Uh, yep. liquidation just because side, we yeah. don't have that cron job, right? We don't yeah. have you know, logic within the game. So we had to build those li liquidation events to, to create that kind of mechanism where if someone drops below, they can get liquidated. Yep. Yeah, but uh, thank you. And uh, we're, we won't keep you longer, but we, we appreciate I, the I time you question. spent with us. I have one question. Oh, and, yeah, shoot David, it, just, shoot just it. one last one, it, yeah. In the game you showed, that it's like a kind of big game that um, the wallet that said there's, uh, the wallet said there was 20 million die in there. Is that real or is that some sort of decimal thing? <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah. No, definitely not. <laughs> I, I, I am David's not. Was that Galliath? Where was that? Where, was that? <laughs> where were we? It, it was the game that had like a C or something. Oh, and you okay. Could trade. Yeah. 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 That's Galliath. Yeah. Definitely not uh, 20,000. 20, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, oh, it says X die 20,000. That is the block number. That's the block number that Gnosis chain is, is on right now. And you'll see that increment with, with each five seconds that passes by. I see. I see. Hey, yes. you know? No, I am not. <laughs> I, am, I am not a rich person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you, right. Austin. Yeah, uh, thanks. And th thank you, everyone, as well. So we'll, we'll do this next week again around Wednesday, and we'll have Richard from Facer join us to build Thank uh, you. Games on top of uh, that. That things was that a really did. great session. Will Thank this you, recording everyone. be available? Will this recording be available again? Or yes, it will be. Uh, so I'm okay, going to stop cool. recording now and.